welcome everybody to this uh, joint WIPO uh, AIPPI seminar, webinar. My name is Arna Holden. I'm the executive director of uh, AIPPI. These are indeed extraordinary times. The coronavirus has spread through the world and our thoughts are with all those affected. Switzerland, as most of the world, is currently on lockdown. The AIPPI General Secretariat in Zurich, as well as uh, WIPO in Geneva, had to close their offices and most employees are working from home. I am sure that many of you are also joining us from your homes. So although this webinar has been produced by professionals using the latest technologies, I can ensure you that it's, it is 100% homemade. Like a homemade cake, I'm sure that we can expect fresh food for thought and content that is served while still hot. AIPPI is currently, currently stepping up its digital presence through uh, new webinars, our social media channels and our website so that we can all stay connected while staying at home. We are looking forward to roll out a new website and further educational online formats in the coming weeks. As for today, I'm delighted to welcome you to a premiere, a joint WIPO AIPPI webinar. We came up with this idea when we were discussing AIPPI's official annual visit at WIPO headquarters. These official annual visits are only one part of a very close and long-standing cooperation between AIPPI and, and WIPO that dates back to the creation of the WIPO in 1967. I'm very pleased to welcome five distinguished senior uh, WIPO staff members who will provide us with an update on the latest development in trademarks, designs, and GIs on the PCT Madrid and Hague systems, as well as on IP enforcement. The session will be moderated by AIPPI's report general, Mr. John Osha. There will be plenty of time for questions and answers, and all participants are encouraged to submit questions to our speakers. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Some of you have also submitted some questions via email. We will carefully select the questions and uh, depending on the number of questions, we will probably have to uh, uh, re reduce them to a few. Again, I would like to thank our speakers who kindly agreed to participate in this new format. And without further ado, I will now hand over to Tom Bombeles, Head NGO and Industry Relations at the WIPO. Tom, please. Thank you, Arno, and uh, welcome everyone. <clears throat> My name again is Tom Bombeles. I'm Head of NGO and Industry Relations at WIPO, and as such, <clears throat> I'm one of the principal points of contact between the AIPPI Secretariat and the organization. Uh, the purpose of today's meeting was uh, explained very well by Arno, and I want to be very brief, uh, just introducing the five uh, experts and colleagues um, by their names and titles. You have their bios, and <clears throat> we'll leave the rest of the time for the presentations and the interaction. One other point I want to make to all of you AIPPI members, and as I have been discussing with Arno, is uh, of course we're in a special period as we all know, and it's uh, rather difficult, but to try to make the best of it, I just want to emphasize to all of you and to call to your attention that um, today's event does not have to be the last of its kind in the sense that we are very happy, my, uh, my colleague Christopher Ruggiero and I, to arrange further briefings for AIPPI and its members on other um, topics within the purview of WIPO um, at your request. So what we're all trying to do obviously is um, reconfigure our work plans um, and see what we can continue to deliver in terms of our objectives. Um, given um, given the circumstances that we're all living in. So one um, suggestion and open invitation to you, the AIPP members, is uh, if you have other issues that you want to be briefed on or would you like to learn more about uh, in terms of WIPO's operations, services, et cetera, 
please uh, put them forward and we'll be happy to uh, arrange those and work on those with you. So thank you for that. And without um, further, uh, further taking up of much time, let me just say, um, as you see from the schedule, there are three um, main uh, subject categories this afternoon. Patents, which will be presented by Mr. Ken Natsume, Senior Director, PCT and uh, PCT Legal and International Affairs Department. Under the heading of Brands and Designs, we have Mr. Marcus Hopperger, Director, Trademarks, Industrial Designs and Geographical Indications. Mr. Gregoire Bisson, Director of the Hague Registry. Ms. Debbie Renning, Director of the Madrid Registry. And then we move on to the Building Respect for IP issue, uh, which will be Mr. Xavier Vermandele. Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to an interesting afternoon. Thank you, Arno. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is John Osa. It, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, be the moderator of this session. And uh, without further ado, Ken, I would ask you to uh, proceed. Thank you very much, John, and thank you very much, colleagues, for the kind introduction. So uh, let me start with my great, great thanks to all of the colleagues for this opportunity and uh, this difficult situation. Uh, since we have to be efficient in the time management. So let me directly go into the presentation itself. And I have my stopwatch with me. So I try to do my best to <coughs> stick with the timeline. Okay, now I'm supposed to cover the update of the latest information about the PCT. Here is the maybe Many of you have already seen this kind of view graph. This is a geographical coverage of the PCT contracts in the states. We have currently 153 member states with the addition of one extra country in 2019, which was Samoa. And as you can see, uh, we see a wide coverage of blue area, which is covered by the PCT member states. So for those of you, who would like to seek the protection of your invention, these are the areas where you can enjoy our global service, PCT. However, of course, there are some gray areas which are not yet covered by the PCT. I have the list of the member states which are not yet in the PCT system. So for those who are interested in seeking your patent protection in these countries, please be careful because the PCT route is not available. So you have to go through the Paris normal route. And we are hoping that we could welcome more uh, possible participating in the member states, but under current situation, uh, we are not yet sure how the things would evolve, but we are making our effort continuously. This is the statistics which we have just released last week uh, by the director general in the according to the latest statistics in 2019 we have received almost 266,000 international pct applications with a growth rate of 5.2 percent this week also imf International Monetary Fund released the latest economic world economic outlook, which included the world economic growth of 2019, that was 2.9%. So we happily saw this because we uh, our growth rate ratio was more than the world economic growth, which is a good indication for the confidence with our PCT system. However, as you may be aware, the world economic outlook also included the projected uh, economic growth for this year, 2020, which is minus 3.0%. So this is quite significant and we are not yet sure how this would affect our global services However, we have to carefully monitor the situation. And as you know, many PCT applications come with the priority 
which means the actual PCT filing takes place around 12 months from the original filing date. So maybe affect could be a little bit later on, but we'll see how the situation evolves. This is also the latest uh, statistics of the top 10 countries of the PCT application in 2019. For the first time, China now at the top rank for the PCT application, surpassing the United States that have been on the top rank from the beginning of the history of the PCT, namely 1978. More than 22% are from China, almost 22% are from United States, close to 20% applications are from Japan. And as you can see, almost 64% are from top three countries and almost 78% are from top five countries. And if we add up with 15 countries, it's covering 93%. And I'd like to mention the Asian region covers more than half. So the significance of the Asia as a source of the innovative activities is quite remarkable. Here is the top 10 applicants of the PCT in 2019. The top applicant was Huawei Technologies followed by Mitsubishi Electronics, Samsung, Qualcomm and so forth. As you can see, there are four companies from China two companies from the Republic of Korea, and one company from United States, Japan, Sweden, and Germany. So again, we can see the uh, major portion of the application from the Asian region. Here is the breakdown of the top five technical fields of the international application. The computer technology was the top, which is close to 9% followed by the digital communication, electrical machinery. Thanks to those technologies, I think we can do this kind of uh, webinar in the budget. And this is followed by the medical technology and measurement. And taking into consideration the current situation under COVID-19, probably uh, we might see more applications, international applications in this field as well. We'll see how the situation evolves. Let me touch upon the discussion amongst member states and users Every year we hold PCT working group in spring. And this year it was scheduled from May 26 to 29. However, under the current situation, it was decided that this meeting would be postponed. Taking this opportunity, let me touch upon a couple of points that member states were expected to discuss. One of the issues was the proposal for the amendments to the regulations, which is about the implementation of WIPO standards ST26. ST26 is a standard for the XM filing, especially for sequence listing. This is very important area. And we have been aiming at January 1, 2022, the actual as an actual implementation of this new standard. Though we do not have the PCT working group in May, uh, we continue to our effort to meet this target. It is likely that we will send out the circulars regarding this proposal and member state with a aim where the member states can finally 
reach upon agreement in the upcoming PCT assembly, which is scheduled in this September. Also, member states were expected to review the supplementary international search system, which have been in place for significant uh, number of years. And along with PCT working group, the member states was also, were also expected to discuss uh, in the Committee on Technical Cooperation about the possible appointment of the Eurasian Patent Office uh, becoming as an international authority. Eurasian Patent Office has submitted its application and it was supposed to be discussed to make an advice to the PCT assembly in September. And also we would like to keep our effort to maintain that agenda be rolling. So we are thinking of how we could do the preparatory work toward the assembly in September. Let me take this opportunity to touch upon the latest COVID-19 related issues. Last week, we have just released the dedicated page on PCT website for these COVID-19 issues. You see this link, or you can type it in, or you can copy paste in, but you can easily navigate yourself going to top wiper page and just click patents. Then you will see on top of the page, this box COVID-19 update, where you can click here and you have all the latest information related to COVID-19 related issues. And similar uh, pages are also available in the other uh, global services such as Madrid and The Hague. Couple of points I'd like to highlight here is, first is the, due to the difficult postal services availability to and from the Switzerland, we have decided to suspend our paper communication regarding PCT applications. So we no more send our communications in the form of paper and we strongly encourage the applicant attorneys to communicate us in the form of electronic means. In this sense, I would like to strongly recommend all the colleagues if not yet done, to think about our EPCT service, which is of course free of charge and available 24 seven with good security. And you can transact all kinds of information related to PCT, your PCT applications. Of course, you can file the application as well. And we have been receiving questions and contacts regarding what kind of remedies would be available if you are about to miss the deadline or if you have already missed the deadline, for example. And of course, there are issues with local IP offices. However, we also posted an article which include practical advice regarding possible remedies for example, if you pass the deadline, what kind of remedies are available in relation to PCT rules? And also, we have just released the interpretation of the International Bureau about a specific rule which deals with so-called force majeure situation in an emergency situation, I would say. And of course, this is an issue of the interpretation. The, our view, International Bureau's view is that current COVID-19 pandemic related situation is considered as a case for this emergency situation, natural calamity or other like reason. So for us, 
international bureau, we will take that into consideration in a favorable manner. So we could be as flexible as possible in order to uh, secure the right and benefit of the stakeholders. And we encourage, we have encouraged other IP offices and international authorities to act like that. Lastly, before I close my presentation, we have also released the crisis management dashboard yesterday. So this is brand new information. This is the latest information regarding how the operation of WIPO, especially WIPO services are going on. So with this monthly updated crisis management dashboard, you can have a look at how the International Bureau or how WIPO Secretariat is operating, working, even remotely, that we are doing very best effort and for those services such as PCT, Madrid and The Hague, we are op operating, functioning, uh, almost full-fledged side and we are continuing to provide our services to the user. So I think now it's about five seconds before 15 minutes. So I'll stop here and I'm happy to have any question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken, for that very informative update. And thanks to you and all of your colleagues uh, for the excellent work that you're doing uh, to continue operations and provide guidance in this time of crisis. Uh, it's appreciated by, by all of us. Um, I have one general question. Uh, and then uh, several specific questions um, to, to ask to you. And I would like to remind everyone online that you can submit questions in writing using the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, and we'll take as many of them as we can. So starting with question one, um, you, you may be aware that uh, AIPPI does um, a number of study questions every year. One of the questions that AIPPI considered last year uh, was on the topic of whether plausibility should be considered as an independent patentability requirement. And that inquiry had, had three subparts, so to speak. Uh, the, the issue of whether a claimed invention needs to be credible, um, how to treat speculative claims, and whether prophetic examples should be permitted. So AIPPI resolved that there should be no standalone ground of patentability based on plausibility and with, with this in mind, how would WIPO treat an application having claims that appear to be speculative or that describes technical effects that appear to be implausible? Is there a de facto credibility or plausibility determination to be made? And if so, how would you measure it? Thank you very much, John, for the question. I think this is a very important and interesting question. And patent laws, as we, everybody knows, that require that the disclosure of an invention be sufficient enough to enable for a person skilled in the art to reproduce the invention. It also requires that claims shall be fully supported by the description or the specification shall contain a written description of invention. In exchange of disclosing such an invention, which becomes public domain later on, an exclusive right or a justifiable scope of patent protection can be enjoyed. Though it may be indirect, the plausibility issues may have an impact on the determination of inventive step and other patentability criteria. As everybody might know the WIPO does not conduct substantive examination of patent application per se, including PCT application. We only do the formality examination. Having said that, PCT regulations and PCT international search and preliminary examination guidelines do include the provisions on sufficiency of disclosure and international searching authorities, international preliminary examining authorities are conducting their international search and examination with these rules. 
in line with that, let me touch upon three points, if I may, John and colleagues. First thing is the Standing Committee of Law Patents, SCP. While the, this Standing Committee's work is confined to a fact finding at this moment, the agenda of the SCP includes a number of substantive patent law issues, such as assessment of inventive step and sufficiency of disclosure. Based on the input received from the member states of WIPO, they will have done the studies on this subject matter that covers the underlying policies, laws, national and regional practices of the member states that were prepared and discussed in the committee. In relation to the sufficiency of disclosure, the study touches upon especially issues relating to mere speculation of possibilities, mere assumption of results, and predictability of variance covered by claims, and to the extent of generalization of claims. And the study in plural studies are available on WIPO website. And if interested, I can share the uh, URL of the studies uh, later on to the Secretariat of AIPPI so that uh, colleagues can have a look at that. Second point, if I may, uh, is about the artificial intelligence. I think one of the related field is the uh, emerging technology such as AI. In this area, WIPO has circulated the draft issues paper on IP policy and artificial intelligence with a view to welcoming comments from various stakeholders. And we had actually disclosure issues for patent as one of the key points. For example, what are the issues that AI assisted or AI generated inventions present for the disclosure requirement and so forth? And we have received more than 250 submissions and almost more than 90 submissions touched upon this issue. And we will revise the draft uh, paper and we will publish the updated one sooner. We have originally planned to hold the second session of the physical meeting in May, but now it has to be postponed. So we will see the when we can resume the session. Also, the Standing Committee of Patent SCP produced a background document, which includes the issue relating to the plausibility of AI-generated inventions. And member states have been discussing and share their views. Finally, very quickly, the five big offices, namely IP5, they have also been discussing this disclosure or written description of sufficiency of disclosure issue. They have done the uh, study based on the hypothetical case and they analyze the cases together with the industry and that report are also available online. So I can share the link later on. So I'll stop here then I can have further successive related questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and indeed, I, I think uh, this is particularly uh, an important question with respect to AI related inventions and uh, hope that we can have further conversations on that topic in the future. My, my next question is from Luis Alfonso Duran of Spain. Um, and uh, it's, it's a little bit long, so I hope he'll permit me to paraphrase it. Uh, his question is uh, noting that uh, the COVID-19 problems that a company encounters um, apply not only to what's happening with the IP office in their country, but to all countries in the world where that company owns IP rights. And so he observes that approaching extensions of, of terms as the IP offices have been doing, taking into account their local health uh, conditions, uh, doesn't really take that into account, um, noting that uh, different offices are taking different steps. For example, the EPO extended terms until April 17 and EU IPO until May 1. Uh, so the question is, can WIPO, being a, a worldwide IP, IP organization um, and being a UN agency, lead a movement to promote a worldwide harmonized approach 
uh, to, for IP offices to take uh, during this special time. Thank you very much. This is a very valid, important and uh, question. I think probably there are two aspects. Uh, we have also received this kind of question and we are more than happy to be a facilitator, coordinator or a catalyst to have some unified or harmonized approach uh, uh, toward this situation because as you rightly mentioned, if their deadlines are different from country to country, that would cause some confusion and if that would make the situation even more complicated, which is not very much user-friendly at all. That's why we have just uh, released, as I mentioned in my last presentation, we have released uh, uh, the interpretation of current available uh, rule. In that uh, release, we have explicitly uh, mentioned that, for example, we will not issue the declaration where the PCT application is withdrawn until the end of May, and it could be extended further on. And for example, if the other countries can follow the same line, then that would be, uh, that could lead to the more harmonized approach. However, this is not legally binding. The other way is, of course, we can have some more say legally binding harmonized approach. Technically that can be done and we could think about it, but the challenge would be even though if we create a new rule or a new law, whatever new international treaty or anything like that, usually it has to be accepted or ratified in each jurisdiction, which could take some time. Sometimes they have to submit it to the diet or parliament and it could take additional month or year. And we cannot wait for that. So that's why as a first step, we release this interpretative statement as an international bureau so that at least we could encourage the member states and IP offices to look at the similar or ideally same direction so that we can have more coherent and harmonized approach. So that's the current situation, and we will do our effort more. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And if there's anything on the user side that we can do to support your efforts, please let us know. Uh, and likewise to the participants, uh, if you're aware of specific problems right now in your jurisdiction that are not being addressed, um, you know, please let us at AIPPI know, and and uh, we're happy to act as as your filter, so to speak, and and uh, try to put our forces together combined to, uh, to address these issues as, as well as we can, noting the practical limitations uh, that Ken has mentioned um, with, with respect to uh, getting actual laws passed. Um, my next question, Ken, uh, is referring to your slide about the top fields of technologies dominating uh, the international PCT applications, um, do you see any long-term trends in terms of upcoming new fields of technology and particularly with respect to AI, of course? Thank you very much. This is a very interesting question and uh, I have to be very careful because this is, <laughs> it's very hard to see. And so maybe this is, uh, this is not an official uh, uh, view of the organization. This is more like my personal impression, if I may. I think the computer technology and digital communication uh, continues to be the one or the very major aspects. Because if we think about the product, let's say mobile phone, that involves many technologies. So even in order to achieve this one mobile phone, probably you might need hundreds of patents. So that's why I personally believe this computer technology, digital communication, the number of patent applications would remain relatively high. Then if we think about, let's say, medicine, sometimes the one medication can be protected, very limited number of patents. Let's say if the, the one subset of medicine can be protected, one or two, one is the material and product, 
The other one is a method or a process. So in that sense, the impact of one patent application, one patent right is extremely big in the medical field. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that we will have huge number of patent applications in the medical technology. However, as briefly mentioned in my presentation, since now this uh, medical issue is a top priority, so I'm sure all the researchers in the field are rushing into the development of new technologies, new viruses, new method of the diagnostics. So I won't be surprised if we see the significant increase in this field as well. And we are here well, to- Thank you very much. Um, and uh, you actually answered another question that had been asked by one of our attendees. So that's wonderful. One of our attendees had asked uh, whether the epidemic will uh, result in additional filings in this area. So I think you answered that question. Uh, thank you very much. This has been very informative. Thank you very much.